Good afternoon, Facebook world. Welcome to another Facebook Live. My name is Jen Bengal from Out of the World Literacy, and I've been doing a whole series on Facebook this summer for teachers and homeschool parents. If you haven't checked it out yet, you can look back. I'm trying to pull up my calendar here. This is the calendar of the third annual Facebook Live summer series. We are on June 7th, so today I'm going to be talking about a parking lot for teachers. And I don't mean where you actually put your car, but I mean a real parking lot for your notes. So I'm excited about that. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Jessica. Welcome to the Facebook Live today. I'm doing it a little bit early because I actually am going to be going to hang out with some friends tonight. I am super excited to just go on a little triple date with some friends of mine, so I moved this down to a two o'clock time. Hi, Terry. I'm glad to see you on here. I'm glad you caught me. Hey, April. Welcome. I love it when you guys say hello to me. So today, we're talking about the parking lot. Does anyone know what the parking lot is? Do you know what I mean when I talk about parking lot? Um, what I mean is... A lot of times when I am teaching in the classroom, I have so many ideas I want to share with my class that come up through our conversations and I can get super distracted. If you're ever ADD or you go off in one direction or another, a lot of times we can, we can take every teachable moment opportunity and then it can get a little bit overwhelming and our lessons can get really long. So I created this parking lot. And actually, hi, Larissa. Hi, Priscilla. So glad you're on. I think you've been on every live so far. You're amazing. Hi, Heidi. Welcome. So actually, I came up with this idea when I was working as a literacy coach. So kind of a short story. I would go into classrooms and I would help teachers. I would observe them in their classrooms and then we would get together. And we'd have a meeting afterwards and we'd go over some ideas of uh, what worked well, what they could try out for next time. And we just had a lot of fun like supporting each other. And so there were a lot of ideas that I would get when I would watch a teacher in the classroom, but I could only pick one to talk about with them in our meeting afterwards. So I decided to create a parking lot because I didn't want to forget all of the things that I thought would be really fun to bring up with that teacher, but I also didn't want to overwhelm that teacher by talking about 10 different things. So it's kind of the same mindset with students, and I transferred that parking lot into working with students. So when you're working with a student, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, in a small group, in a whole group, and you've got all these ideas that you want to use to help them with instruction, but you don't want to overwhelm them, use the parking lot. And I actually have a free download for you today. This is actually a Facebook Live I did, I think a few years ago, but it looks like this. So this is just the thing I came up with and you can get this for free. Um, we can have Andy put the link up. Hi, Carla. Hello, Kim. So the parking lot idea is every time that you think of something you want to work with your kids on, instead of focusing on it immediately at that moment, you can put it in the topics to reteach and then put the date down what the idea is, and then you can check off if you retaught it or not. So if you're in a whole group lesson or you're in a guided reading group or you're conferencing and you don't want to focus on that topic right then and there, but you do want to touch on it later, put it in the parking lot so it stays safe for later. This is a really great way for you to take all of those little teachable moments that you think about while you're in the classroom and use them in your future instruction. Everything you put on here is going to be relatable to the kids and something that they need different instruction on. So that's the whole idea of the parking lot. And I see Andy put the link up. So here it is. There's the link that will get you. Actually, it's another Facebook Live with that link on there, too. So if you want to watch me talk about the parking lot from like two years ago, you can do that, too. Hi, Mindy. Hello, Kim. Hi, Jamie. What's Mindy saying? Mindy says, summer school is done for the day so I can participate today. Yay! Awesome! I'm so excited. I know a few teachers that were having their last day of school today, too. Jamie says, Jen, I love all your trainings. I bought the lifetime training packet, but I'm so overwhelmed. Where do I start? Great question. So if you are a lifetime member, I would recommend starting with the webinar that's called Jen Bengal 101. That's a really good webinar that breaks down what's core curriculum and what's something you can use as a supplement. And it kind of gives you an overview of everything that I have available. So I would watch that. 
just watch that one first. That's what whenever I hire someone to come on my team and help me here, I have them watch that webinar first. So that one will give you a really good understanding of everything that's available. And then you can pick and choose from there. Do you want to focus on vocabulary? Do you want to focus on spelling? Do you want to focus on reading? What are you going to, what are you going to go to next? And let me say too, you can't do it all in one day or in one year even. Focus on a couple of different subject areas, get really good at those, and then move on to some more. So hopefully that helps. Hi, Carolyn. I'm glad you caught this live. Um, you love it all and want to watch it all. I know, I know. Hey, I have somebody else on here I know. Hey, Jax. That's my sister, y'all. That's my sister. She's my big sister. I'm glad you're on here. She has nothing to do with teaching, but she's on here. I forgot to turn my phone off. This is what happens when I'm live. She's probably texting me now. You just added my name on Facebook. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> or hi, Carla. Jamie, thanks for your question. I needed that same info. Yes. So if you're in a lifetime, if you're in the lifetime members course, it can be overwhelming right when you first get in there because there's already 13 webinars in there. So you have so much training, but that's why it's a lifetime access. So you can watch it forever. So start with the 101. And if your focus is going to be on reading and writing workshop, take the reading and writing best practice workshop. If you want to focus on spelling, go into the interactive spelling. And so under what's great about the lifetime access is it's broken into each webinar. So it's, it's in tiny chunks too, even though it feels big all at once. But if you just zoom in on one webinar, you'll get the certificate for that one webinar in there. You'll get all the notes for that webinar in there. All the bonuses just for that webinar will be in there. So it's kind of like more manageable that way. And if you're wondering what is she talking about with lifetime webinars, um, I have a l access to all of my webinars for life. You can watch over and over and any future ones I add to. That's at lifetimewebinars.com if you want to look at that. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Clarabelle says, guilty. I'm on summer break and I've been watching your Facebook lives from two years ago. There's so much good, there's so much good stuff. Yes. Okay, y'all. I've been doing summer series. This is my third year. So some of the stuff is like, the same, but a little bit different with a new angle and perspective on it from two years ago. But you can go on my Facebook page and click on the videos section and you can watch Facebook lives from two years ago, from a year ago. There's all kinds of free support in them. You can search through them by titles. So if there's just one certain thing you want to look at, you can just go and look at that as well. So I'm glad that you're finding those again. Okay, so we talked about the parking lot. Here it is, and the link for that you can grab if you want to start using a parking lot in your classroom. You can do that. And here's my question. So I've been taking questions from people in my curriculum group. I've got four today with my answers on the back. The first question is from Jennifer, and I'm probably going to say your last name wrong, so I'm sorry. Jennifer Ceylon, Ceylon. She says, we use the reading straight. What might be the best way to complement or enhance teaching through that program? So I love that she asked this question because when I was teaching third grade for five years, I was using a basal reading program too. And I'm not a basal person. I just was forced to do it. You know how the admin make you do things you don't want to do? Yeah, Shh, don't tell anybody. But so what I did actually was I turned the basal into a workshop format because I'm a workshop person. I'm a reading and writing workshop person. I feel like that's best practice for my kids. So I took the basal reading series and I turned it into a workshop. I actually used the weekly story as a mentor text along with other great read alouds that I was bringing into the literacy. And I took the comprehension lessons that were in that basal and I turned them into mini lesson statements. I show you exactly how you can do that in a free resource in my store, actually. And I'm going to have Andy put that link up. He's in the kitchen. Andy, put that link up, man. I'm waiting for him to yell at me. No, he's not yelling at me. So he'll get that link up. And it's a free resource in my store. It walks you through exactly how you can take your basil and turn it into a... Um, a, ment a mentor text for reading and writing workshops. So that would be a great thing for you to look at, Jennifer. And anyone else who's using the basil, is there anyone else that uses the basil because they have to, but they really do want to use a workshop? If that's you, download that thing. Andy's popping up soon. I know there's a delay on the comments, but it'll be up there. Okay, next question is from Jean. Oh, another hard last name. Don't you hate it when you can't pronounce Beanhoff, Beanhoff, I'm guessing, Jean. She says, how do you handle dyslexic students who just don't write for you? 
This is a great question because I actually have a, a student at home. His name is Jonah, and he struggles a lot with writing. And so I've been doing all kinds of things with him at home to see what will work with him. And there's a couple of things that are working really well right now. So if you have kids who are struggling with writing, this is what I have for you. And oh, here, before I talk about that, there's the link. So this is the link that will help you with the basil that you're forced to use. I see Jessica said yes. Oh. And Shaquana said, I use Journeys. This resource will be great. Yes. Stephanie, too. She said, I can't wait to see this. Yeah, this is always free. I actually show you how I did a whole week. I give you lesson planning templates that you can do it, too. It's awesome. I really need to do a whole webinar on it because it was so powerful in my classroom and it really transformed how we did our reading. We still had, we still did the mandated basil, but we just turned it into a reading workshop. So you guys can take a look at that. Okay. So to answer the question about dyslexia, if you're working with kids with dyslexia and they're struggling with writing and how do you manage that? I found this app that I really like for Jonah. It's called Epic. Has anyone heard of the app called Epic? I'm pretty sure it's free. I don't know. Andy downloaded it, but I'm almost positive it's free. <laughs> and Marie said, yes, do a webinar. <laughs> okay. Okay. I got you guys. Everyone's like, yes, please, please. Okay. I'll look. I'm going to write that down. Webinar on Basil. Basil webinar. All right. That's that's one that I might get on a bandwagon about, you know, because Basil's. Ugh. Okay. So anyways, Epic reading app is awesome. So the Epic Reading app is an app that has all kinds of books for kids, informational books, not just regular stories, but they do have nonfiction. They have all kinds of uh, fiction stories as well. It's awesome. So my son loves it. What he does is he gets on the app and I give him a piece of white cardstock. Okay. So this is what I do with him and he struggles with writing. He struggles with a lot. So I give him a piece of white cardstock. He gets to pick which story he wants to read. He usually picks a nonfiction story about sharks or the ocean or some, he's obsessed with volcanoes currently. So he will read a book about, he'll read a book about volcanoes. What he's really doing is he's listening to the story and there are words on every page. So what I have him do is after he's done listening, I have him listen again and I tell him to pick out what he thinks is the best part of that story and copy it onto the white paper. So what he does is he actually just pauses the Epic app and he writes down two or three sentences about the story. And then what's amazing is he's able then to read those back to me, those sentences back to me, and then we have a conversation about what he thinks. And we talk so much about his opinions about the volcano and what he thinks might happen if he gets nearby one and why there even are volcanoes. So having him actually copy the words down helps him to focus on getting everything spelled right, looking at one letter at a time, putting the space in between, and then having him read it back to me. And then we have our conversation about the comprehension seems to be really working for him. So that's just an option that you can do. Um, and in writing with kids who are struggling with dyslexia, a lot of times I start with lots of conversation because kids who are struggling with dyslexia are often very bright. They're very smart. They can comprehend amazingly. They can do a lot of high level thinking. They just have a really hard time with the phonics, with the morphemes, with putting those things together. Their eyes sometimes can, can visually kind of bounce. And so it's a really hard thing for them to do the basics, but they're super smart. They're so smart. They come up with all kinds of strategies to get around doing the basic things. So what I'll have them do is we'll start with a conversation. I will start with sketching with them. I might do a sentence starter for them. We'll also break apart um, the writing into more manageable chunks. So if we're going to work on an informational piece, for example, I'll have them talk to me about what the beginning is going to be and what the end is going to be. And I'll have them just write one or two sentences for the beginning and one or two for the end. And then we'll work on putting together the middle. So breaking the writing down into manageable chunks for them is something that's really helpful to do with them too. Um, yes, Mindy said, some dyslexic students like to use the computer. I have also used an old electric typewriter. It's free. Colored paper helps as well. I love that idea. The old electric typewriter because that makes them put in one letter at a time. I love that. So cool. Susan says, we, um, she loves epic books. I use them in my library and she loves this idea. Yeah. You know what? 
they're still writers if they copy something that someone else wrote down. And if it's a couple of sentences, and then they can maybe come up with their own sentence off of that, just anything to get them started, because a lot of these kids just need that encouragement, they need that motivation, and they can write a few things down and then talk about it or make up their own thing based on that. So start with having them copy something down and then moving into doing their own work. And copying just a couple sentences will really give them the the confidence and encouragement to get that, you know, that small stuff down and get them started. Sometimes doing something, the hardest part is just getting started, right? So have them start just copying a few things to start with. Um, Yes, oral brainstorming. Thank you, Carly. She said she's a dyslexic therapist. Awesome. I'm glad you're on here. They need lots of oral brainstorming and guidance line by line for paragraphs so that it doesn't seem overwhelming. Exactly. So like Carly would say too, I'm sure is to break that writing down. Like today, we're just going to focus on the intro. And we're going to do that and we're going to have a conversation about it first and we're going to come up with something together and then put our own thoughts down. So great. I'm glad you're on here, Carly. Thank you for adding to that. Okay, next question is Amanda Pressler. Amanda asked, what do you think is a must to teach weekly when teaching ELA to three grade levels or to three grades and what could I give as independent work or practice? So she's asking, what would I um, teach as a must weekly and what could I give as independent work? So my answer is, in your mini lessons for those different grades, I'm not sure which grades you're talking about, what three grades you have, but this would apply to all. In your mini lesson, you need to be teaching for reading comprehension. So your mini lessons should be teaching reading comprehension skills. You should be teaching, you should be modeling, practicing, and all of that good stuff before they move into independent work. So once you have a skill that you've done in your whole group, say it's uh, making connections. You've modeled making connections. The kids have practiced making connections. Then they can go in and do that in in their independent work. So as you build those comprehension skills in your whole group mini lesson, they can start practicing those in independent work more then. So after a while, you can have them practice what you've taught. It's a really great way to kind of have a spiral review. So that's what I would say. Uh, make sure that you're covering reading comprehension skills. The ultimate goal for reading is to read for meaning. So we want to make sure we're always talking about meaning. We're building the network of strategies that's going on in students' minds as they read. And that's all good stuff. All right, last question today. Liz Herbert She asked, how do you set up your reading and writing spaces in a classroom to incorporate anchor charts and student work samples with limited wall space? Like this question, I've had this one a couple times before, and I have one, two, three, four, five things I wrote down. So these are five different things. So with the limited space, this is what I do. There are only a few anchor charts that I leave up all year long. Most of the time, I just leave them up for a week. So I'll leave anchor charts up all week ideally is what I like to do and at the end of the day we'll reflect on our anchor chart so a lot of times I'll have an anchor chart for reading and an anchor chart for writing and then in spelling I just have one a week so I'll have one anchor chart on Monday in spelling and we'll just work with that one chart all week so I don't need a lot of space for spelling and um, what I'll do then is at the end of the day we'll reflect on our anchor charts another thing I like to do is I'll leave them up all day because as we're transitioning I'll tell the kids if you think of something else you want to put on our anchor chart today feel free to write something else down and put your name next to it and then we'll look at it at the end of the day so as we're lining up for gym class or we're lining up for lunch class the kids can go back to wherever that anchor chart is and write something down that they thought of because you know our reading thinking doesn't just end at the end of reading workshop. It can last all day. So I encourage them to do that. And then at the end of the day, it's really fun to see who added to our thinking from our mini lesson that day. And then at the end of the week, I know I've said this before, but at the end of the week, I will auction off the anchor charts and the kids love bringing them home. I don't know why they, I I can imagine these kids putting their anchor charts all over their, their bedroom and studying all night, but I'm pretty sure that's not what happens. But Oh, well, they love taking them home. They love taking these anchor charts home. So I just give them to the kids. I do a little raffle at the end of the week um, based on how good they behaved. I'll pick that many tickets and I'll have, you know, all kinds of things like candy and erasers and good stuff. But I'll also anchor off our auction off our anchor charts for the week. So that's something I do. And then another thing you can do, which I've seen teachers do, which I think is a cool idea, is you can take pictures of your anchor charts just on your iPhone or whatever, and you can create a digital library of your anchor charts for the year. You can also, if you want to go old school and print them, you can have a printed 
photo album of all your anchor charts for reading and writing. And you can leave that maybe in the classroom library or reference that when you're in your mini lessons too. Um, another thing is having the students write in their notebooks. So as you're working in the reading workshop and the writing workshop, having them put some of the things that are on your anchor chart in their actual notebooks so that that way you don't have to take up that wall space, but they still have the information in their notebooks to last all year and beyond, which is really good. That's what, one of the reasons why I love notebooks. All right, so I got everything covered today and on I'm gonna take a few days off, but Sunday night, oh, Sunday night's a good one. Sunday night at eight o'clock, I'm gonna talk about how to spot a fake reader. Have you ever seen kids fake reading in your class and you really just wanna like go, I know you're, I know we need to work on something here. I'm gonna talk about hi, how, uh, I just read Jean's thing, hi. No, how to spot a fake reader. My brain is going a million places. Thank you, Jean, she said, I love your webinars. There she is. I love how I can put your comments up here, isn't that cool? Hi, Jean. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of webinars, I actually have one this Saturday morning on the intervention program. So if you use the intervention program or you're looking to use the intervention program or you want to mix it up, say you're only using it for your struggling readers, but you want to use it for your grade level and advanced readers too, I'm going to talk about 12 different ways that you can use the intervention program on Saturday. So it's a really good webinar. I'm only doing it one time live in June. If you're a lifetime or you already have lifetime access, so you can watch it whenever you want. But that's happening on Saturday. Speaking of lifetime too, I almost forgot. The price for the lifetime webinars is actually going up on June 11th. So once you're in, you're in, you always get access to the future webinars. You don't have to pay anything else. But it's going up because I'm adding four more webinars. So if you've been on the fence about getting lifetime webinars and you want to get it before the price goes up, I would do it before Monday. That's at lifetimewebinars.com. You can learn more about that. And next week, I'm doing my reading fluency webinar. So the first time ever that I'll be hosting the reading fluency webinar will be on Monday. So you can go to, actually, I think I can type on here. Yeah, johnbengalwebinars.com. That's where you can get um, sign up for live webinars. And then for lifetime access, head to lifetimewebinars.com. There you go. Hello, Colleen. She said, so excited now that school is out to catch up on your webinars and resources. Yay, school's out. Yay. You can have a couple days just to hang out with me every day if you want. <laughs> Hi, Ava. Welcome. Um, oh, Rachel. What, what did Rachel say? She said, one of my colleagues made PVC hangers for table-sized anchor charts. Ooh, I like that. Did she use those in whole group or just guided reading? Because I could see using those in both. That's awesome. I love that idea. Those PVC pipes are, are, are awesome to do different things with. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, thank you guys for hanging out with me. I um, Next time I'll be live is Sunday night at 8 p.m. Central, talking about how you can spot those fake readers and how you can help them and answering more teacher questions. And then on Saturday morning, I will have a webinar that I'm hosting. So enjoy your weekend, enjoy your rest of your evening and your Friday tomorrow. Hello to all the teachers who are just getting off. I'm so excited for you to have, enjoy your summer. Um, take care, and I will talk to you again on Saturday morning if you join me in the intervention webinar or Sunday night for the Fake Reader Facebook Live. Bye, everybody.